Novage webinar, make the best use of Intersoft Intelica 2022-2023. Today, you will learn the basic principles to make the best use of Intersoft Intelica. This is part four of our Inter Intersoft Intelica tutorial series. You can search on our YouTube channel for part one, two, three, so you'll be able to master the software. Just search for Novage. The new 2023 version, just came out. And in this webinar, um, they'll be cover some of the new improvements. So stick around. Today's webinar presenter, Richard Zins, is the head of the international department at Arcadia Soft. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Novag and where you can find Intersoft in Talicat. Um, Novage is changing the way designers purchase 3D software, offering more choices, more freedom, best advice, faster services, and no headaches. So check us out at novage.com. And now let's um, share Richard's screen. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Nova Edge webinar on Entersoft and Telecad, the fourth in our series. So I hope you've watched the first ones. Let's begin. Today we'll be using our latest version, which is the 2023, and continuing from the 2022. Uh, it is still all working in the same way as we are discussing the basics of the program. Today I'll discuss entering texts, dimensioning, query options, and tables. I will start today's session by discussing the texts, and to do this, I will use the drawing I used during my previous sessions. So, the program offers the option of displaying single line or multi line text. They are located on both the home ribbon and the annotate ribbon, where there are more options related to text. As I mentioned, in perhaps the first of our series, the home ribbon contains the most important, most used options from all the ribbons, while most of the options for a particular item of modification or setting are already on the various other ribbons at the top of the screen. I will now proceed to insert a single line text, meaning I selected from the list. The program asks to indicate a point. Now the program asks you to either enter, confirm the height or to introduce another value. I'll introduce a value of 5 for myself. If the angle of rotation is other than horizontal to the right, then of course you specify it. If not, you click Enter. And now I can enter a single line text. By clicking on Enter, after each entry, you can create several such texts. And finally, you choose Escape to exit the options. When you get closer to this text, please note that when you select it, you can see that it is a single line text. This is not a paragraph. One line is selected at a time. If I want to modify the Enter text, I select the text. If the Properties window is not displayed, as in my case, here on the left, right-click and select Properties. Here it is possible to change both the height and the style of the text, which I will talk about in a moment, the color, the angle, and the position of this text. So here you can modify everything, including the fact that there is a field content where you can add something. And after confirming with Enter, it will be visible. If I double click on this text, I can also modify or add something. If the field here after the text selection is too small and you want to write in here, then that too is of course possible. Now, for multi-line text, I choose the option here. I click selected with an area. So that's going to be the size of my insertion box. Of course, it could be larger. I can expand it at any time, narrow it down as needed. But please have a look at the top of the screen now. 
a new ribbon has appeared, a text editor. It is available only after selecting text, multi-line dimensions and elements related to multi-line text. When you want to enter text, you can choose a text style. The style of the text includes its height and font type, so you can either take these parameters from the style or enter your own. You can also define whether, for example, the font should be bold or italic. Bold or italic will not apply to all fonts, because remember that the program uses true type fonts, such as Arial, and they will undoubtedly be subject to these modifications. However, fonts such as SHX or with technical fonts, bold may not work because they are drawn with a line. More or less in the middle part, you have options to determine what happens to the text, whether it should be left aligned or right aligned, whether it should be justified or centered. There is also field symbols, so if you want to enter, for example, percentages or squared, you choose from this list. I'll come back to that in a moment. Here, you have the option to insert a field. So after clicking on this option and chose it, for example, you insert a date into the text, which will be renewed depending on when you open the project. This date will always be read, so you can also enter this type of text right here. Spell check is also possible. And when you're done typing, just click close. Now, if I click enter and go to another line, Thereafter, all the lines will be selected together for editing. But as you may have noticed, if I showed a smaller typing area than my first line, of course it was moved to the next line. And now I'm going to close it and enter this multi-line text again. And I'll show you how to enter special characters. So, for example, I type in, today is a warm day, the temperature is 28, oh, and I have to put in a symbol for degrees. So up here you select symbol and select degrees. Please note that what is on the right side of this list, namely here, are the shortcuts you will need if you want to enter the exact same thing in a single line text. There, there are symbols. Uh, there's no such field with symbols to choose from, so you will have to use these symbols and enter these labels yourself. Just please remember that you can find them here, and in a moment I will show you the most used ones. If some symbols are not listed here, please remember that there is an option Other at the bottom, and you can choose the ones you need from the window. Please note that some fonts may not contain certain symbols. Then you will need to change the font. If there is no symbol in a given font, it will show such a square or a question mark, depending on the font. And here you close it. And now, in single line text, you need to type in according to what was there in the list. So degrees are... So degrees are percentage, percentage, and capital D. And there is the sign for degrees. And as you can see, when you type in this last letter, it automatically changes to what you want to be shown in this place. Now it will be the diameter. So I enter percentage, percentage, and C. 
There are capital letters shown in this list in the multi-line text. You don't have to type these letters in uppercase though. It is enough that they are in lowercase, but, you must, um, but they must be entered in the indicated order for a given symbol to be created. I think that's pretty uh, obvious. It's similar to other programs also. Now, let's say that it's going to be a value of 20. Just so that you can see that, I want to enter a 2 in subscript. That's why I put a space here just in case. The special character starts with a backslash, and then U with a plus. And here we have 2082 in this font. So you can't use this option. That's when you just need to change the font. On the other hand, if you want superscript, it would be a backslash U plus 00B2. And there we have superscript. If it was to the power of 3, then it will be similar with a backslash a U plus 00B3. And we have that cubed. If you would like to enter a tolerance mark, that is plus minus, then backslash u plus, and you would enter 00b1. And almost equal would be the backslash u plus 2248. And unequal would be backslash u plus Two two six zero. Remember that you do not have to remember all of these signs. I have just showed them here, with the, and I showed you the most commonly used ones. Remember, if you would forget, you can always, instead of using the one-line text, you can just use the multi-line text and enter it from the symbols by simply choosing it from the list that is shown here. And for example, and here you see this uh, subscript 2, for example. Uh, only before that, you would have to enter 20. So you can enter it anyway. Just remember that this is one line text and there's no possibility here to enter the symbols from the list. You'll have to enter them manually. When you work with text, the text styles are very important. This is the default text format that you enter. With multi-line text, you can, of course, change it at the top on the edit text ribbon. But in a single line text, you can only change the size of the text. So what is this text style and how do we get to it? One way is using the Home Text Styles Manager ribbon, but generally it's best to go back to the Tools ribbon. At the end of this ribbon, you have the Intersoft IntelliCAD Explorer area and its individual parts. I already have it shown, but I'll use this direct transition. By default, it may be that it will open this way. I keep everything in one window. This is that icon. This is what the Explorer looked like in previous versions. For me, it is clear because I have access to all elements of my project, which is convenient for, amongst other things, exchanging textiles, dimensions, blocks, or any other settings between documents simply by moving them to, say, a tree of another project. How to add another style? Let's write style 1. I don't advise naming the styles this way. I suggest you name them in a way that you will know what you will be using them for. So if a style is used for dimensioning, I name it a dimensioning style. If it is to be used for something else, then of course write either what kind of font it is or what it will be used for. Why do I suggest a different style for dimensioning? Amongst other things, because the default style has no height, for example. That's why I had the default size of two units in the file here. While the default is 0.2, so it's quite a small text. You may not even notice it sometimes when inputting. That's why it's good to define your text. If you enter this size here, 
it will be shown by default in the single line text and moreover in multi-line text with a default size but if you use this type of text for dimensions then if you enter it in the dimension that the dimension text is to be 15 units and not 5 units then the program will not accept it at all it'll accept only the one that has already been defined in the description style so remember that if you use any style for dimensioning and you have to use one of the styles remember not to define the text height for it now how do you switch between styles when you choose the annotate ribbon you will find that there are more objects for defining and modifying texts there is another one also in the express tools ribbon there's a section for entering and modifying text in case you are missing something here if I start entering now before I choose the text I can define that it will be using my style 1 so it will be Times New Roman and show where the beginning is the angle of rotation please note I don't have a question about the height anymore because the program took it from the height style and the height of the style was given there at the time of defining by default this style has no height which is why the program asks for it the rotation angle is zero and now you can see that it's a different font so you'll be able to choose that style before entering it as I mentioned earlier in multi-text line this can be modified at any time so let's move on to the dimensioning I will show it on some element introduced here you should start by entering the dimension style manager window why I'll show you when I enter any dimension in the basic default settings you can see that you can't see ah, the text is tiny as in the case of entering the default text of the single line text this value is quite small so it may happen that again you will only notice the line that's why I'll leave it for now later it will be modified with what I'm going to change in the style here but I'll, I'll also be moving on to another project where I can discuss the elements that I'm introducing these different types of dimensioning so you enter the dimension style manager on the annotate ribbon in this part of dimensioning here you can add your own dimension style why are we doing this when you have different scales used in drawings generally the drawing will be on a one-to-one -one scale but sometimes you want to detail something so you draw detail that are enlarged in relation to our model they are two times bigger four times bigger or five times bigger and then you know that your dimensions which will be here will not work not only in terms of font size but also in terms of the values that will be shown because they will be scaled therefore you obviously need to bring in several dimension styles and define which ones you're going to use and switch between them just like you switch here on the ribbon as far as the text goes it's going to be exactly the same principle we create a new style we call it dimension one it's just a copy of what was defined here I'll start with the first tab which is lines I favor that what we have on this layer then in the layer we also define the color the line type and thickness but of course in each element and when drawing lines as I showed in the previous presentation and now for example defining the dimension you can change both the color scheme the line type and the thickness of the line so if necessary you can modify it the dimension line for your information is the line that is under the dimension extension lines are those lines that come from your dimension element to the dimension line extending beyond the tick marks this is the line that extends the dimension line behind the dimension and possibly in front of the dimension if the symbol that is at the end is for example a tick mark full arrowheads close the dimensioning and then the program does not show this line if there would be a tick mark then this line will show and you will have to define its thickness as for the baseline spacing firstly a horizontal or vertical dimension 
Such a single dimension is called a linear dimension. This is one of the types of the entry dimension. The one at the angle is the dimension parallel to the points you select. If you want to describe one element by, for example, showing successive dimensions on the same line, this will be a serial dimension. Here at the bottom of your element. On the other hand, if you describe an element by reference to one of the points, as shown here, that is a base dimension. And now for the distance that automatically inserts with the base dimension. That is that distance that is now showing between these lines and automatically this next base dimension will show above the line that you have already entered. So if it happens that the lines overlap in the base dimension, you immediately delete the dimension you entered. Enter this window, modify the value and enter it again because the entered dimension is already a linear dimension and you will have to modify it manually. Of course, you can manually move it, but then you have to be careful with the precision when it comes to the exact value that will be shown here. On the right side, you have even more detailed information about the dimension extension line, which means that you have the option of turning off parts of the line in both the dimension and the dimension extension line. And on the right, you have the information about the dimension extension line, how it will behave, which is the one here that goes from your dimensioned element. You have it marked here that the start of this line shows 20 units from the element. Maybe a little less here because it's an arc. So if you're a little bit further away, it looks like it's merging. If it was a larger value, it would be more visible but you can also enter it as a fixed length and then you show the length for the part of the extension line. And this dimension line is this little bit of this extension line here that goes up above the dimension line. So you can still modify these values. Remember that the size of the text is basically adjusted to the drawing so that it is legible. So it may happen that for one drawing, the size of the tick mark or arrowhead 10 will be good but not for another one. So remember that you adapt it to the project and save it in the document and then transfer it between documents. Remember more or less what you did to make this style of dimensioning fit your drawing type. Now, another tab is the symbols and arrows. On this tab, you can choose how your dimension line starts and ends. There can be two other markings if you want, just check the box here. And here you can choose what will be at the beginning and possibly at the end of your dimensioning. If you have any blocks in the project, you will be shown here on the list. You will be able to enter them instead of these defined endings. Here you also have information about how the dimension line will end and if you cannot fit the text or here in such cases as, for example, you define the dimensioning of a circle or an arc. Here is the size of this marker. When it comes to marking the center of either an arc or a circle, in the lower part, you have the choice of the marker and its size. By default, it's the cross that appears after selecting a given arc or circle. In the text tab, you can choose what text style you choose, and if you do not have a style here on the list and you would like to add it, you can always enter the Explorer. But please remember, if you enter the Explorer from this window, we will have to run this Dimension Style Manager once again, because it will not return to this window automatically. The color of the text, whether there is a background underneath or not, sometimes the background is put in especially if there are a lot of elements, so that doesn't obscure those values for you. The size of the text, as well as the size of the markers at the beginning and at the end, are adjusted to the drawing. As for the text orientation, I usually have the text aligned with lines. It depends on what you want. Here you can see that this text would be between the lines. If I want to move a little on this dimension line, it is enough to specify appropriate value, how much you should be shifted relative to your dimension line. If the vertical text is to be consistent with the dimension line, then here, in the lower part, the text inside the extension lines is set to align to the line, not horizontally, otherwise you'll have it shown this way. There is also a frame around the text that you can apply, and then these lines won't go on top of the text. Now the Fit tab. I usually just use the setting that you can see here, 
but it depends on what you need in the project. The main thing is to define what will happen when the entered dimension is so small that the text will not fit, or what will happen if the arrowheads do not fit. So then you define whether you should, you should have a leader line or whether this leader line should not show where the text should be. Remember that regardless of the style, you can change and modify any single dimension text directly in the drawing. Remembering that there should be as few of these elements as possible. Try to adjust your dimension style so that as few elements as possible have to be modified manually. Now for the next tab, which is primary units. Format of unit, units, accuracy, so that the number of decimal places, rounding accuracy, and quite important scale factor, global factor. By default, the value is one here, and no one cares because most of the dimensions are given that way. What is to be measured is measured, and there's no need to change it in any way. I'll go back to this example where I have drawn a detail that is several times larger than the project. So obviously after dimensioning, the dimension value will be several times larger than it should be. In order not to enter such a defined text entered each time and not to change this dimension manually, I simply enter the scale factor appropriately so that it is reduced. For example, by detail is five times larger. Then of course I'll enter zero two. If there is a different value, then a different magnification will be needed. Thus, scale it accordingly. And then when you enter a dimension, you won't have to worry about modifying anything. The program will do it automatically for all elements in this dimensioning style. So I suggest that you use dimensioning styles. The next tab is alternate units. If someone needs it, we also have these parameters and the tolerances for the project can be selected and defined. I click OK continue and close. Now I'm going to enter this dimension into this drawing that we were using previously. Here I only have standard and because I added a drawing here which was also dimensioned, it's a bit hard to see on the white background, I would like to use this dimension style that is here which is already defined. How to do it? I'm going to go into the IntelliCAD Explorer window. Where I have been before, while we are working with the text. And now, I'm going to go into this project. But in the dimension style, so please note, I have dimension 1. My drawing, and the one we've been working on since the first presentation. So it's drawing 1. So I'll just move this dimension to the left side on this tree on the project where I want it to be moved. I'll close this window and switch to the drawing. And now in dimensioning, so the annotation, dimensioning, dimension one, and this dimension, I can also modify, and for example here as it's marked, I can choose that this style of dimensioning will be this dimension one. Not any other, and you can see that it's modified. Please note a rather important thing. Now I'll introduce dimension one in the dimensioning style. This dimension is assigned to these elements. The point is that if I modify such a dimension element, then of course the dimension automatically follows this element. So these are the so-called related dimensions. If I want to enter unrelated dimensions, I can modify the value of the variable that now assign these dimensions to elements. But before I do that, I'm going to detach one of these dimensions from the element. Sometimes you want them to be assigned to elements because you're modifying now, and you don't need to modify this dimension later. But sometimes you prefer that dimension not to be pinned. In this case, if it is to be detached from the element, then I enter the dim disassociate variable. It's D-I-M-D-I-S-A-S-S-O-C-I-A-T-E. Please have a look at this icon that looks like an unlocked one. So an open padlock and a dimension. So unlocking this dimension. After confirming this variable, the program asks for the dimension. I indicate it. I can also indicate several dimensions. If I want to indicate only one, the right mouse button and now please note, if I return almost to the original size with this element, this dimension will not be modified, but this one still holds. 
so I only unpinned one. If I want a new dimension not to be assigned to elements and not to be modified together with elements, then there's another variable. This is the dim associate, but it's spelled D-I-M-A-S-S-O-C. I choose this variable and from the value 2, which is the default, I change it to the value 1 and confirm with enter. And now these newly entered dimensions will no longer be assigned to the element. I will introduce some other dimensions. I have an arc. So I can dimension it. I show the length of it. I can also show the serial dimension on the, on the example of a table. I select the first dimension and now I select the continued dimension. From this baseline icon here. And I only show the subsequent elements that are to be dimensioned. Now on the other side of the table, I'm going to introduce this baseline dimension here. What matters is what the base is, where the first point is. If I clicked here and I entered it in the opposite way, it would theoretically not matter for the dimension, but the baseline would be from this place and not from the beginning of the table. So now I select the baseline dimension where the table starts and enter the next one. And now see how I show the, another one. That is from the same place and the 38 units that were there, I think, are put in between these elements. Now the circle and the center lines. For example, here's a circle. It may look weird, but it's just that the line was assigned to the circle. Like here you can see how we played with those lines. Weird. If anyone hasn't seen it yet, the type of lines and their thicknesses have been discussed in previous presentations. Now, when it comes to entering the diameter, I'll describe it here now. The diameter can also be shown this way, but for this you need to enter the appropriate dim at fit variable. And we set this variable to 2 and enter the new diameter dimension again. And please note, now the existing diameter has not changed, but the one I am entering now is already visible on the line with two arrows, but only after entering this variable. Here, just in case, I'll mark it in blue in the command area. So that is more visible and I will be able to quickly define this dim at fit variable if necessary. Variables and access to variables will be discussed in the next presentations. I'll also talk about printing and about more advanced settings and program options. So I do encourage you to participate in them. When it comes to dimensioning, I would like to discuss one more thing. Maybe it's not exactly dimensioning, but it is possible to introduce a multi-leader simply to show and describe elements. And here too, I suggest that you start by defining this reference line before selecting it, for the simple reason that it will be the same as in the dimension. This default size is so small that you can still see something while typing, but after you enter it, it won't be visible anymore. I choose the multi-leader style manager. Here I either define my own or modify the existing one. And again, the reference format, here we specify the size. I'll start with the first tab, the leader format. Here we have what is at the end of the line, the size of this arrowhead in this case, and I'll only want other values, a different way of drawing than the default from the layers. Then I can choose it from here. And here there's also information about whether it will be a straight line, whether it will only be an arrow, or whether it will be a spline. You can choose whatever you want. Here, in my opinion, there's also quite an important option, namely whether at the end of this reference line there will be text that you enter, as it is now because it was the default setting. Or there will be a block that you'll indicate and you select this option. 
It can also be a table that you want to describe. That could be a few elements, so as not to insert it every time. You can define it all here. It may be just an arrow. You can do that too. And here again, the height of the text. Let's say 10. You can also define how it is arranged in relation to the line. Then I click OK and it's all visible. When in a dimension, when copying to another document, you simply select Ctrl C and Ctrl V. If it is in the standard style, it will take over the style setting from the document to which we copy. The situation with the leader lines is different here. First, I'll insert an element near the dimensioning so you can see the difference. Even without inserting the text, you can see that there's no arrowhead. Now I'll insert this copied element and you can see that it has kept its size. Unlike the text style and dimension style, you can't move it between documents here in the layer explorer because you don't have it here in the set of lists. You have, <clears throat> sorry, you have settings only in the document. So remember that when it comes to the leader lines, you just copy from another document by control C and control V and you have the parameters you need. You can also add another line of multi multiple leader lines. There in the properties window, there's a maximum number of these lines that you can enter. I think that's more or less all that you need to know about textiles in the leader settings. Now I would like to show the insertion of a table. Not a table like we did in the previous webinar where I showed both blocks and blocks with attributes. Now I'd like to show a table option. It is also in the annotation ribbon here in the table part, but also in the home ribbon except that there is also one table option on the home ribbon. As I mentioned earlier, there are only basic elements on the home ribbon. And again, as with the dimensions, as with the leader reference, multiple leader lines, here I strongly suggest that you go into the style manager first and then insert the table. Why here you ask? Well, amongst other things, this is because by default, this table is defined in such a way that because of the background, you won't see much. Therefore, I suggest that you go into such a table and simply modify it. This is something that you will not be able to modify after inserting the table. While here, you can change various parameters during or when editing. Whether there is a background fill or not, you'll be able to draw, you'll be able to define anywhere else but here. So, first, I remove this background. When you remove the background, the parameters that you define here will be modifiable if necessary. Of course, you can enter them, for example, margins, whether there is text in the middle or not, and the height of this text. I'll type the number two and I'll do one for the others. You can define if there are and what are the boundaries. Then there's the title and the type of cells next. They can be in the same parameters or different. I suggest for the title you choose some other, but it is of course up to you which parameters you want to modify. I'm going to make the last two tables types exactly the same. Well, I click on OK. I close and now insert the table. By default, I have five columns with a width of two and a half. But if I have such a high text, I'll enter a width of 30 centimeters, a height of two, and here I will make four rows and I can choose which cells are defined where. I click OK and insert the table. The table is being inserted in such a way that all rows and all columns are the same, but after the selection, you can still modify them. With the blue squares, you modify the cells, and with the blue arrows, the whole table. Now you can enter text here. The text will show up shortly after typing. The default selected style can be modified and all its parameters can be defined, so boldness, size, etc. Even though I set there in the window, I can still modify it here when entering. Now, if I want this table to have any merged cells, I select two of them. I'm holding the left mouse button and I use the option Merge Cells here in the Table Edit ribbon. Whether it's horizontal or vertical, it doesn't have to be two cells either. It can be four or six or whatever you need. If you want to unmerge a cell, then of course, after selecting it, you have the option to unmerge it here. Of course, 
if it consisted of more than one cell, either due to a division or, for example, because this cell is one cell by default. But since we have five columns, it can spread out into five columns. I can mark it. If it's a single column, then please note that I don't have that option. But I can, for example, enter a column left or a column right. The same is with a row. And now I will enter some text. And I can define this text, what it will be, for example, on the left or on the right. You see what I mean by the small text? <laughs> Now, please remember that when you have all these parameters, you can only enter one row per cell. I have merged cells here, so it automatically went to the next cell. And now, what I showed with multi-line text may be useful here. So a field for inserting, for example, a date, that will automatically refresh. Here I can enter it so that I don't have to change it when printing. So you can also define such things here. Pen thicknesses can be defined by layer. And here, after selecting the table, I have these elements to be modified. So line type, thickness scale, and thickness. By default, it is of course the same as in the layer. And now, for example, I will show a table that, after inserting the columns, probably has the same number because, yes, here I have six columns while there are eight rows. So to define this table, eight rows were entered and then by combining two cells, I could get such a table. It all depends on what kind of table you need. And remember that if you want to have two fields to enter in a row in a given cell, then you'd rather have to enter two cells because there can only be one line of text in one cell. And now I just wanted to show you something like the inquiry options because sometimes it comes in rather handy. I mainly use the distance option by entering DIST, dist. I show a part of what I want to measure only to see what length or angle it has because I need to know, but I don't want to have it left in the drawing. Please note on the drawing, nothing has changed. Only in the command area at the bottom of the screen, the distance appeared. So the length of that part that, is, uh, that I indicated, the angle and the area on which it was entered and how much is X and how much is Y if I need that information. You can check such parameters using the distance option. The same with the field. Just click on the whole field, right mouse button, and at the bottom, you have both the perimeter and the calculated area, as well as the coordinates of each of the points I indicated. So this data is available. If you turn off this command area, remember that F2 is a shortcut to such a report window. This window shows you all the parameters available under these options. If you need to count something, for example, you have several lines and you want to check their length, it's here in this part of the tools in inquiry that you have the option of total length. Then just select the particular elements. It doesn't have to be only a line. It can also be an arc. The right mouse button confirms and shows me the total length of all three elements that I indicated. It's the same with the area. Here I have the option of total area. So I need to show the elements to calculate the area. For example, a circle, a polygon, I approve and I have the total area of the elements, not indicated as single, but as many as you need. It makes it easier to check if everything is as you had wanted it to be. In addition, there's also information such as how much time you spent on the project, if you're interested in such data, when you started and when you finished. A rather useful option for checking how much time people spend on doing their projects. For lines, it might not be that important, but if you have some elements like ACES solids or that you enter it into the drawing or you've got the drawing and you want to check the parameters, then list entity info will show quite a lot of information about this element here. So this may be useful as well. 
The ID coordinates of a given point, which will also be shown in the command area, if you want them to stay in the drawing, then of course you have to select such a dimension from the description and dimension ribbons. And that's going to be it for today's material. I encourage you to watch the next presentation, which will be mainly about printing with Intersoft and Telecad. So thank you for all your attention, and we'll see you at the next one. Thank you so much, Richard. That was so useful. And I hope you will all go and check out part one, two, and three. Um, just go on over YouTube and search for our channel, Novedge. Um, I want to remind you where you can find Intersoft Intelligent 2022 and now 2023 and novage.com. Um, Novage is changing the way designers purchase 3D software, offering more choices, more freedom, best advice and faster service. Uh, so check us out on novage.com. Have a great rest of the day and um, till next time, everybody. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.